Okay, it's 12 o'clock on the dot, uh, so we'll get started. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining me for uh, this Wednesday. We're going to be talking about uh, dealing with absent employees in the workplace and how we um, navigate those issues and some key provisions to remember and I've also got some case examples that we'll walk through as well in terms of um, how best to navigate these issues. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to um, pop it in the chat um, and I'll do my best to answer those as we go through um, or I'll leave some time at the end um, to also answer any questions you have. Um, I'm recording the session, um, so if you would like a copy of the recording, um, please feel free to email me and I can um, send that through to you. I do send out the slides as well, so everyone will get a copy of the slides. Um, other than that, we'll get started. Um, so in terms of what we're going to talk about today, um, as I said, we're going to obviously be focusing on absent employees and unfitness um, for work and how we go about navigating um, those concepts. Um, making reasonable accommodations and adjustments. Um, so in some situations, particularly if there's an um, injury or a disability, um, there's a requirement on organisations to consider reasonable accommodations and adjustments. Um, so we'll talk through that. Uh, independent medical examinations, um, which is always um, a topic that gets a lot of questions and whether we can send people to independent medical um, examinations and what our rights are in respect of that. And obviously some risks in terms of terminating employment and how we uh, best minimise those risks. And then we'll finish up with some practical tips. Um, I thought I'd just um, start with uh, kind of some trends that we're seeing, um, particularly in relation to wellbeing at work. I love a good statistic, so I thought we'd start with that. Um, and this is from the Australian HR Institute um, a survey that was done of employees and the biggest causes of their struggles at work 2020 and 2021. And I thought it was interesting, um, some of the changes that you see. Um, there's been basically more than double um, percentage increase in terms of dealing with people. Um, which I thought was interesting. So obviously everyone's been at home by themselves, not having to uh, deal with different personalities and things like that. Um, so I think that is something that we will see um, as an issue when everyone starts to come back to work. Um, and again, kind of building that workplace culture back up again, because everyone's been so separated for so long. Um, so I think uh, being mindful of that, particularly as HR managers, which I, uh, most of you are here or leaders, uh, being mindful that that might be something that employees are navigating and thinking about ways we could um, increase or um, yeah, increase the positivity around coming back to work um, and what that means for people, but being mindful that there might be this hesitation. Um, also, it seems like um, money is um, something that's increased in, in concern as well. Um, so managing money, as we can appreciate, some um, employees uh, make hours or their partner that's lost their to things. Um, so being mindful that there might be those outside factors that are impacting on them, I think, um, is something to remember as well. Uh, interestingly, um, there wasn't uh, really a change to physical health, but there was a decrease in mental health. Um, and I think there's a number of reasons for that. I think um, from my perspective and what I've seen in practice, organisations have been quite good um, in terms of offerings and things they've done for employees around mental health during this time. And I think it's probably been a bigger focus than what we've historically seen. Um, so I think that might be a reason for that change because I um, just like in terms of clients and organisations that I've been dealing with, from my perspective, I think there's probably been a bigger focus on mental health and all the things that you see on LinkedIn that different organisations packages and things like that. That's probably not something that was historically done as much. Um, so I think that's perhaps why we've seen a decrease um, in that. But just being mindful that there are other things that have increased for people. Um, and again, thinking of ways we might be able to navigate or manage that um, and be mindful of that for people returning to work. I think that's going to be the biggest issue um, at the moment. Um, so when we talk about um, reasons that can lead to absenteeism and particularly 
uh, long-term absenteeism. I've got some um, examples on the screen there of common things that I see again um, in practice around when we have employees that are away for longer than a couple of days. Um, obviously, if there's an injury, um, that's going to impact on uh, people's ability to do work um, and uh, they might be on workers' compensation, for example, so that's something you'll have to navigate um, and, again, a common reason for um, long-term absenteeism. Uh, another one that we see quite often is sexual harassment. Um, so, again, um, particularly if someone's being subject to sexual harassment or alleges they have been, um, then that um, is usually a reason why they take some time off. Bullying, um, again, if um, they've experienced bullying. And I will say also um, that those people that are the subject of allegations, again, tend to also take some time off because obviously um, they will say generally, oh, I didn't do it or I wasn't aware. And again, kind of um, processing those allegations, you might generally find um, that they will take some time off as well. Um, then you can have non-work-related injuries. So obviously if someone gets into a car accident or something um, on the weekend um, and that impacts their ability to come to work and do their job um, and performance management. So probably most of us here know the common situation where we start to performance manage someone and then all of a sudden they're sick and can't come to work or participate in anything. Um, and that's a tricky one to navigate because obviously um, you generally have medical certificates that are giving you information that say they can't, they're unfit for work. Um, and then it's a matter of, well, how do we go about that performance management process? Um, obviously, we can't do that while they're not at work. So that's always um, a difficult one. But I think when you look at those um, different um, reasons on the screen there, there's ones that we can um, navigate and deal with quite easily, I think, and then other ones where it becomes a bit more tricky, like the performance management one I was talking about, um, uh, particularly managers and things like that tend to get a bit um, concerned around what that means and it might lead to a bullying claim if we continue to press the performance management issue, things like that. Um, if it's a sexual harassment or a bullying situation, we might really quickly um, by doing, for example, if we say that an investigation is needed, we might be able to get through that pretty quickly, get it resolved. Hopefully the parties um, can come to a resolution or there is some disciplinary action if we do find there was a bullying um, allegation that was proven or sexual harassment and we can get employees back to work pretty quickly. Um, and then obviously the injury or illness one is very dependent on what those injuries or illnesses are. So someone might break a leg and they're off for a couple of weeks or six weeks and then they can come back to work or they can do work from home, those types of things. And then there's obviously other illnesses and injuries which you're going to have a longer term impact. Um, so I think really understanding the reasons um, that can lead to the long-term absenteeism and probably having some kind of plan in place around how we deal with these different things that might arise. I think will allow us to more easily deal with them and guide our managers and leaders in terms of dealing um, with employees who have these types of absentees. Because again, in practice, what I find is that managers kind of get annoyed as soon as employees are off and are like, well, what am I meant to do now? I don't have someone doing this job. Um, and again, if we can kind of guide them and say, well, we have this process in place, and this is how we deal with this type of situation, um, then I think that's something that we can do to benefit them because they're kind of not already on the back sort of have a negative attitude to the absenteeism. And again, in practice, and you probably will all know this from experience, generally, if an employee is off work, um, they're either going to come back to work or there's going to be an ending of their employment in some fashion. Um, so there's kind of only two situations. Um, and look, it's, I don't know what the statistic is, I probably should have looked that up, but um, if there's a long term, the longer someone is off, the less likely they're to come back to work in my view, and I think that you will find that in practice as well. Um, so the longer that absence extends, the less likely they're, they're um, going to come back to work and we just have to navigate through that. Um, so as I said, um, those are the reasons, and I think it's important that you understand the reason for the absence um, and get as much information as you can around the reason for the absence. And then that allows you to manage how you deal with that absence. So like I said, if it's an allegation of bullying or they feel like they're being discriminated against or 
there's um, allegations of sexual harassment, you should be able to, as I said, investigate or look into those matters pretty quickly, deal with that situation and hopefully come to a resolution which has the employee back to work. Um, if it's an illness or injury, like I said, um, there will be medical certificates usually that are provided that hopefully give some indication around what that illness or injury is. And then that can um, hopefully guide you in terms of um, what you need to do in terms of managing that return to work. Again, um, a lot of feedback from HR managers and leaders tends to be you just get a medical certificate that says unfit for work and doesn't give you any other information other than that. Um, the thing to remember is you can ask for more information um, and say, we need more information to be able to manage your absence um, and understand what the length of time you're going to be away is. Um, is there th things that are going on that we need to be aware of? So if you think that there's some issue with the manager or something like that, you can ask for more information. Um, and one of the things that I would encourage you to do, um, and this is in relation to um, absences, make sure that you have a policy or in your contracts, something that deals with the evidence requirements if there's an absence from work. So don't just think that it's accepted that people have to provide a medical certificate if they're absent or something like that. Have a policy around what your requirements are for that. Um, and also think about having a clause in your contract or a policy around independent medical assessment. And we'll talk about that um, a bit later on. But again, having something in the contract that gives you as the employer the ability to send someone to an independent medical assessment and it's in the contract is much easier in my experience and practice to get an employee to do that if they've agreed to that in the contract rather than relying on an implied um, duty for them to obey that direction. And I'm not saying you, that, that isn't there, you can still direct an employee even if there's something not in the contract, but it just in practice is much easier for an organisation to be able to point to that clause and say, well, here's where you've agreed to attend the independent medical assessment and we now require you to do that. Um, so gather as much information as we can around understanding the reason for the absence. And there might be personal circumstances that are going on for them um, and they might not want to divulge too much around that, but at least understanding that it's not something that's related to work because, again, um, as an employer, you'll have obligations um, from a number of perspectives in terms of if it is a sexual harassment or a discrimination thing, um, we have obligations in respect of health and safety of employees at work. So if we know it's not linked to something that's work-related, then we can, again, navigate that perhaps in a different way to what we would if it was an allegation of harassment or bullying. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and talking about what needs to be considered managers, so that's why I think having some type of plan or at least guidance about how we deal with employees being absent from work is good for managers. Because, again, what I find is generally they're like, oh, someone's off work, I need to navigate that, and that's really annoying, and it's kind of that negative attitude. Um, so, again, having a way that we deal with it um, and providing our managers with that guidance I think is good. So finding the cause, managing that cause, they might have to find someone to do that role for a period of time, and, again, assisting them with navigating that. Communicating with the absent employee is particularly important. And I think um, you should consider who's going to do that communication. So don't have five different people communicating with the absent employee. Pick one individual who's going to be that point of contact for the absent employee. So they're not getting mixed messages and they're not getting a text message from the manager and then some chased up from HR, particularly if they're off work because they're saying their mental health is not great or things like that. Getting 500 messages is not going to probably um, assist with that. So think about how that communication is going to happen. Um, also, um, for the manager's perspective, there's probably going to be someone who has to manage their emails or their duties. So again, having some process in place to deal with that. Um, and also thinking about communication with other employees. Uh, because again, sometimes the rumour mill starts around why an employee is absent. Um, again, kind of having a communication to employees that someone is just off sick. Um, or whatever the communication is, just keeping that consistent as well is particularly important. 
I think, um, and tends to stop that rumor mill. Um, and again, if it's personal situations and things like that, we don't want to be divulging that type of information. Uh, but not saying anything in my um, uh, uh, experience tends to just incite that rumor mill and people come up with all kinds of wonder, wonderful ideas as to why someone's off sick. Um, so again, how you communicate that. And obviously, if they're client facing or have customers, um, how we communicate that to customers and clients as well. Um, the thing to remember, um, and so now we're going to talk about kind of what the entitlements are and how we should um, be mindful of those entitlements when we're dealing with an absent employee. Um, so the things, um, the key things to remember is obviously that an employee is entitled um, to accrue personal or sick leave, um, and that's 10 days paid personal leave a year they accrue, and that accrues year to year. So if they don't use it in the first year of their employment, it doesn't automatically, oh, it's too bad, you haven't used it, and you start from zero again the next year, it accrues year to year. Um, and it's 10 days. Um, so an employee service will obviously build up the amount of personal leave. Um, and the employee can take that leave if they're not fit for work due to a personal illness or injury, or if they need to provide care or support to a member of their immediate family or the employee's household. And obviously, as an organisation, you can have more beneficial um, entitlements than this, and a lot of organisations do. They'll give more personal leave um, or sick leave, carers leave, things like that. Um, but these are the minimum entitlements under the NES. And the legislation is quite specific that you can request evidence when that employee is taking that personal leave. So that's why I'm saying think about what the evidence is. Usually it's a medical certificate or a statutory declaration that you want from an employee in relation to an absence and the situations in which you would want that um, medical evidence. So is it for every absence, even one day, or is it if the absence extends beyond two days or it's either side of a public holiday, something like that. Um, the, uh, you'll be surprised at how many people try to take personal leave for care of animals and things like that. Um, that is not something that's provided for under the Act. Um, obviously, again, some organisations have leave policies um, that cater for those types of situations outside the norm. Um, but generally, it's just for personal illness or injury um, and to care for um, or support a member of your household or immediate family. Um, so an employee, if they have accrued um, personal leave days, is entitled to take those personal leave days. Um, so just say they've worked for four years, never taken a sick day in their life, and then suddenly they get really sick with influenza or something like that. If they have 40 days um, personal leave accrued, they're entitled to take that personal leave. And you cannot terminate the employment because they're taking that personal leave. That'll be a breach of the act. Um, and be very mindful of communications that goes on between managers and HR and things like that during that time. Um, so I had a matter where um, it was a relatively small organisation um, and it was a younger employee um, who was kind of milking it, the employer thought, um, in terms of their uh, illness. Um, and um, he took a couple of days off and there was text messages basically saying, can't believe you're taking another day off. You've taken the most days off of anyone that I've ever employed, things like that. Um, and so eventually the employment of that individual was terminated and unsurprisingly that employee commenced the claim um, saying that the reason they were terminated was because of their personal leave. Now that was not the reason for the termination. They actually engaged in conduct and performance issues um, that led to the termination. But the fact that those emails or text messages existed didn't help that employer's position because obviously the employee was able to produce um, that and say, well, they clearly weren't happy that I was taking the personal leave. Um, and so I say that that was a reason for the termination of my employment. Um, so just be mindful, again, of conversations or messages, particularly in writing, emails, things like that, that happen um, around people's views on um, employees taking leave. Um, and that brings me to the next concept, which um, is always talked about, again, when employees are on an extended um, absence, and that's this concept in the legislation, the Fair Work Act, um, that talks about a temporary absence from work due to illness or injury. 
So what it says is that an employer can't dismiss an employee uh, because they are temporarily absent from work due to illness or injury. Um, that period or that temporary absence is three months um, or a period of total of three months, any 12 month period. And it also um, can't be a period where the person is on paid personal or carers leave. So if they're getting paid leave, um, it can't be that period. Um, so again, you might have an employee that has quite a um, substantial personal or carers leave um, accrual there, they will generally take that first. Um, and so that initial period when they're on paid personal or carers leave doesn't count towards that three months. And there's been no decisions on this, but again, the general um, view is that all that's needed in that three month period is that a portion of it not be paid leave. So if the three months, um, once we get to that three month mark, just a portion of that has to be unpaid leave. Um, some organisations don't take that risk and they wait for the whole um, three months to be unpaid leave before they consider a termination. Um, but that's the general um, consensus and there's been some cases under the previous legislation that we had that said it's just that in that three month period a portion of that has to be unpaid. Um, and so the legislation says yes you can't terminate an employee because they're temporarily absent from work due to illness or injury which in that example I gave you about the client I had is the um, provision that they relied upon to bring a claim. Um, but that's not to say that you can't terminate them for performance issues or things like that. Um, it's just that the absence, the temporary absence, can't be the reason for the termination. Um, so be mindful of that as well. It's not saying that you can't possibly terminate the employee at all. It's just that the temporary absence cannot be the reason um, for the dismissal. And so uh, in the, that example I gave um, to you, um, that's what we were saying in that case, that it wasn't anything to do with the temporary absence. It was the performance and the conduct that that individual had engaged in that was the reason for the termination. And as I said, obviously the things we had in writing didn't help. Um, another thing to remember is the, this duty of care. So obviously from a work health and safety perspective, employers have an obligation to ensure the health and safety of their employees as far as reasonably practical. Um, so sometimes what we see is, and this is less so now given the protections that we see in the Fair Work Act um, and workers' compensation and um, discrimination avenues that people have available to them, they might say that you are um, breaching my duty of care, the duty of care that you owe to me um, in terms of the environment that you're creating um, and you're not meeting that duty of care. So just remember that we do have that underlying obligation as employers in terms of the health and safety of our employees. Um, and so that's, for example, in making sure that um, the forklifts, people are driving forklifts and they have licenses and we've got the correct scaffolding up, things like that, if it's a construction site or um, things like that. Another um, concept that you hear quite a lot about is inherent requirements. And so this comes up in a situation generally where an employee has sustained an illness or injury. Um, and we are trying to ascertain whether they can perform the inherent requirements of the role. Because if they can't, that is a reason for the termination of their employment. So if they can't perform those inherent requirements, we can say we've considered what the, these are the inherent requirements of the role. We've considered any accommodations or adjustments we could make to the role that would allow you to perform the role. And unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do if that's the case. Um, and therefore you can't perform the inherent requirements of the role and we're terminating your employment. Um, and interestingly, this um, reason has been relied upon in a couple of the recent vaccination decisions we've seen um, in, in relation to certain industries obviously having to be vaccinated and having to come to work vaccinated to do your job is an inherent requirement of the role. So some employees have relied on that inherent requirement um, concept to terminate employment in those circumstances. Um, but in terms of in practice, what I would encourage you to do in terms of ascertaining the inherent requirements, that's where our position descriptions become quite important because we again want something to point to 
that tells an individual or we can say to a doctor, these are the inherent requirements of the employee's position. So what are the essential activities that we need an employee to perform um, that are key to them fulfilling the requirements of their role? Um, and that if they are to return to work, these are the things we need them to be doing. Um, so to give you an example, I have quite a few clients in the aged care industry and um, a lot of those employees tend to sustain back injuries or injuries which prevent them from pushing and pulling um, people for aged care people on carts and things like that. Um, sorry, that's my dog. Um, and so what um, we have in that situation is a position description that says you need to be able to push and pull um, 20 kilos or be able to move a patient um, or things like that. So being um, quite descriptive in terms of the position description, Harvey, sorry, um, being quite um, descriptive in terms of the position description, I think is important for this concept in terms of inherent requirements of the role. Um, because again, we can say, well, when you signed up, you knew that these were the duties were required to be performed. Um, and the injury that you sustained means that you can't do this anymore. And therefore, we, we need to um, terminate your employment. Um, but before we do that, we need to, he's trying to make himself comfortable on the carpet. It's very annoying. Um, Aaron, Aaron, yes. can I ask you a question just yes. on that? You, um, hi, by the way. Hi. Um, hello. Um, just on your reference to vaccination, and obviously I don't seek to get into very uncharted child territory here, but yes. even if you use something else, like, for example, um, just it's escaping me, but something else that isn't vaccination, um, yeah. what, when we talk about um, inherent requirements of the job, we talk about the job description, and we always say that the job description may flex over time. Yeah. But if that requirement, i.e. a vaccination, wasn't there in the original job description, wasn't there in the original inherent requirements of the job on application, mm. um, if we were to use something other than vaccinations, I wish I hadn't yeah. done for you, yeah. how do, do we just rely on the fact that we have contractual obligations around, uh, all contractual um, terms around um, the job description may change. Yeah, when might change? Exactly. You know, yeah. Is that what you're relying on? For That's what I would do. Exactly. And vaccinations is obviously a great example. But another situation might be if you change the way a certain thing is done. So you get a different machine or something, and then they need to be able to do perform it some other way. Um, and we might not necessarily list that in the position description. So yes, I would encourage you to have some flexibility in that position description. And then obviously, um, so in that vaccination situation, even if we had COVID, the uh, uh, um, COVID vaccination case now, I would highly doubt that the position description that was currently drafted for that individual would have a vaccination um, matter in it. So we would be saying, well, the inherent requirements can change over time. And at the moment, this is what the inherent requirements of that role are, particularly if it was like aged care or something where there's a public health direction that says you need to be vaccinated. Uh, but yes, it can um, evolve and change over time. But again, that's um, something um, to think about when you're reviewing. So if you review contracts yearly or things like that, looking at people's position descriptions and making sure they reflect what they're currently doing is um, something I would be doing as well um, when you're kind of doing that review um, yearly or every second year, whatever, however um, you do it. But thinking about what those inherent requirements are. Um, and I was talking about making those reasonable adjustments or accommodations. So as I said, um, when we're talking about the inherent requirements of the role or saying you can no longer perform the inherent requirements of the role, what the legislation requires us to do as um, employers in relation to disability particularly is um, consider any reasonable adjustments that, the, that can be made that would allow the employee to perform the role. Now, that's not to say that anything that's suggested we need to agree to, because there's also this concept of unjustifiable hardship. Um, so we can say, sorry, we can't um, implement that reasonable adjustment or make that reasonable accommodation because that's going to impose unjustifiable hardship on us as the employer. Um, but we need to have valid reasons to be saying that. So we need to consider those adjustments. So like I said, in the aged care industry, um, even though an employee might not be able to push and pull 20 kilos or whatever, um, can we just take that um, portion of their role and say someone else has to do that for that period of time? Um, things like that. 
And again, you would consider what that cost would be. So if we have to put another person on at the same time as that individual, we might say, sorry, that's just going to affect our bottom line too much and it's too costly and we're not going to do that. Um, but if it's that they can use a machine that we already have that allows them to lift the patient, then that's probably not going to cause us unjustifiable hardship in that circumstance. And again, it will be assessed um, in accordance with the organisation and what their kind of situation is. Small businesses compared to large organisations probably have more flexibility. Um, and there's a case I always refer to because it sticks in my mind about a smaller organisation um, who had an individual. And this was, um, uh, so the um, person's wife had the disability and, and he was asking for accommodations because again, under the legislation, you can, as an associate, you can um, request these accommodations. Um, and so he was asking to work four days instead of five. Um, and he was the IT person in the organisation. And the organisation said, unfortunately, no, we can't um, accommodate that because we're going to have to employ someone on the fifth day because we need IT here five days. And that's going to cost us, I think it was about $15,000 um, to replace you on that fifth day. Um, and that's going to cause us unjustifiable hardship. And that was upheld as a valid um, reason in terms of the employer. So the employer was allowed to say that and it, basically they got up on that unjustifiable hardship concept. Um, so, and again, 15,000 to a small organisation is quite significant compared to potentially a larger organisation that has a bit more cash flow, things like that. Um, so it will be assessed on that case-by-case -case basis. But in terms of those reasonable adjustments, it could be flexibility in the hours of work, like that example I just gave, um, or providing um, time off in terms of part-time work for them to recover, um, or providing breaks if they have um, pain or fatigue, um, if they have an issue with their back, it might be that we give them a standing desk, things like that. And again, like I said, you will assess that on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of what those reasonable accommodations are. Um, now, independent medical um, examinations. So this is um, something that comes up quite a lot, particularly with long-term absences. Um, and as I said, generally, um, when someone is off um, sick, you generally just get your general medical certificate that says unfit for work. Um, it doesn't really give you that much information. You can request more information. Um, and as I said, either your contracts or your enterprise agreement perhaps um, should include a provision that allows you to direct employees to independent medical examinations. Um, if it doesn't, you can, and there's been cases that have said that there's an implied um, right of an employer to direct an employee to an independent medical exam. So if you don't have it in your contract, you can rely on that implied lawful and reasonable direction. Um, and we'll go through a case in a second that where the commission kind of tells us what are the things um, to consider as to whether it's a valid request to ask someone to attend an um, independent medical um, examination. Um, my key things are make sure you obviously obtain the consent of the employee um, to go to the independent medical examination. Um, obviously, they're not going to go if they don't consent, but yes, um, get their um, consent. So that's usually done by way of a consent form. Um, and you should be asking for their consent to be provided with the medical report that that independent um, practitioner is going to um, produce. Um, you would write to the employee setting out what you're requesting and the reasons that you're requesting. Of okay, this is kind of where we're at. And again, you generally don't send um, an employee to an IME after a week because um, they generally that absence hasn't been too long. But if it's getting into the month, then you would um, generally look to an IME to kind of understand, particularly if there's not that much information forthcoming from the treating practitioner or whoever you're getting the medical um, certificate from. Then that's a reason why we might say, well, we need some information and we need more information. Um, you will generally bear the cost of that medical examination um, and then depending on the um, outcome of that independent medical examination you might decide if you need further information so do you need to send it to someone else because the report might come back saying I was limited in terms of I'm only a psychologist and you need a psychiatrist or something like that so again um, being mindful of what the report tells us in terms of any additional information that we need because what the commission will say 
if we, for example, terminated their employment um, and they bring a claim, they will say, well, did you have enough information or what information did you rely on in making your decision? And if the independent medical examination says, I think you should do X, Y, and Z and you didn't do that, that's not going to look great in front of the commission. Um, so this is the case I was talking about. I think it's a case from 2016 um, where the commission kindly sets out the considerations um, for an IME in relation to Mr. Cole and what the things that we should be looking for are or considering are. Um, and so you can see, was there a genuine indication of the need for the examination, such as a prolonged absence from work without explanation or evidence, which related to their ability to perform the role? So that's why I was saying generally a week or so, you're not going to be sending them to an IME. It's more when it's getting into the months. Um, has the employee provided adequate medical information which explains the absence and demonstrated the fitness for duty? So you really go to an IME when you have concerns that you don't have enough information or you have concerns that the information you're getting may um, not be all of the information. And again, people tend to have a, a view that treating doctors will obviously um, generally be um, quite uh, kind of employee friendly in terms of the information that they're giving. So think about that. Um, but yeah, if we've got enough information to make a decision around whether they can perform their duties, then we might not need an IME. But that's generally not the case. When we're considering IMEs, we're usually saying we don't have enough information. Um, is there legitimate concerns that um, the illness or injury would impact on others in the workplace? Or do we have a particularly dangerous industry? Um, obviously, did they agree to the assessment? Um, so in some situations, um, employer, employees will say, no, I don't agree to go to the assessment with this practitioner, but I'll go to X, Y, and Z. Um, again, and as long as they're independent, I think you can consider you should consider that in terms of an alternative that they're willing to go to. Don't just say, no, it has to be this one and only this one. Um, again, if it's their treating practitioner, you might say, no, we still want the independent examination. Um, but if it's someone that is independent, um, I would consider that. Um, was the employee advised of the details which led to the concerns about him not being fit? Um, so again, the prolonged absence, the inability to return to work, um, obviously what the role is will be um, important there as well in terms of we need to understand. So if you're saying you're unfit for work and that's all we have, we have no idea what that means in terms of you returning to work. Um, was the medical practitioner advised of the issues of concern um, and was that focused on the inherent requirements of the role? So you can't just be having a shopping list of questions to ask in your um, IME request. It needs to be really focused on those inherent requirements. And I also usually include questions around what accommodations, if any, um, the medical practitioner recommends in those circumstances, if there's any that are needed. Um, so think about what information you're providing to that medical practitioner and also the information about the job requirements. So that's where your position descriptions and things like that become important. Um, was the employee told about the matters that were being put to the practitioner? So again, what I normally do in practice is write to the employee, say we're seeking your consent to go to an IME, um, and in I include a copy of the letter that we're proposing to give to the IME. So that the employee is very well aware of what we're going to be asking. And then again, the last thing is, was the assessment truly aimed at determining independently whether the, the employee is fit for work? But as I said, it can't be like a situation where it's a fishing expedition and we're really just trying to find a reason to terminate um, and there's no valid reason for asking these questions or sending them to an IME in those circumstances. Um, so I think that's a really good list. From that case in terms of things to consider when we're considering sending someone to IME. Um, this is a case um, where the employee refused on a number of occasions to go to an IME. So I always get asked the question, if someone doesn't go to an IME, can we terminate? Um, the answer is yes, because they're failing to follow a lawful and reasonable direction. Um, but I probably wouldn't terminate on the first occasion that they failed to do that. You would give them a couple of chances to go to the IME and then write to them and say, you failed to attend the IME on however many occasions, they're considering terminating your employment, what do you say about that type of situation? And that's exactly what happened in this um, RMIT case. 
Um, so this employee had 26 years tenure, so quite a long period of time that she's been employed. Um, and um, the dismissal was upheld in this case. So it, generally you tend to think that um, if the employee's got a long period of service, you're kind of on rocky ground in terms of terminating. But this um, lecturer was so insubordinate that basically um, the dismissal was upheld. So she refused to undergo the medical um, assessment on numerous occasions. Um, and the Fair Work Commission basically said she took all steps to um, prevent the, um, the uni from ensuring that she was able to perform the role of return to work following an extended absence. And they said that the um, decision to dismiss her was soundly based and defensible. So they provided multiple opportunities for her to provide medical evidence and was also flexible, lenient and willing to accommodate alternatives so that she could demonstrate her fitness. So that's why I'm saying, don't just say, oh, we can terminate on the first occasion that they don't attend the um, IME. We need to get some information or indications for why they don't want to do that. Do they have any alternative suggestions? Um, and one of the arguments that this lecturer said was she took the, so she actually went um, to, she went to the appointment, but the, the documents that she had ready to hand over were the wrong documents and she knew that. Um, and she's like, well, you can't terminate me because I attended. And again, the commission is like, you knew going there that those documents were wrong and you weren't going to be able to <laughs> undertake the assessment. So you can see that conduct. Clearly, um, she didn't want to do the assessment. And unfortunately, not all cases are as clear cut as this one. Um, but the key takeaways from this case are those multiple um, requests to attend the assessment, thinking about alternatives, what we can do to get them to the assessment. And then if they really are kind of just putting up all the walls, then we can move to terminate the employment. Um, and I would do a show cause letter in those circumstances saying, this is all the background, you haven't attended on these occasions, we've offered these alternatives. We're now considering terminating your employment because you're failing to follow that direction. Um, we're giving you an opportunity to say why we shouldn't terminate your employment in those circumstances, particularly if they have access to unfair dismissal jurisdiction, but also general protections. Um, so in terms of uh, these long-term absences, as I said, I think um, the communication point is key. So um, what I find sometimes is that organisations just kind of sit back and allow medical certificate after medical certificate to be submitted and they don't do anything about it. And sometimes it's because it's a big organisation and the medical certificate is just going to the manager and the manager just lets it go on and on. And then... Uh, what happens a lot of the time is a new manager turns up and is like, what's going on with this employee? They haven't been to work for the last 12 months or something like that. Um, so stay on top of the absence. So um, be communicating with the employee. Um, sometimes you'll have employees um, that say they don't want to communicate. Um, again, be mindful of that. But but there's nothing to stop you. So again, you just need to kind of navigate that in terms of what the actual medical certificate says. Um, so if it says they can't talk about work, then they might be still able to communicate about going to an IME, things like that, but they don't want, if it's a bullying or harassment thing, they might say, I don't want to talk about that, but I can do this. Um, also, um, if you do want them to attend a meeting and the medical certificate says they're currently unfit for work, um, sometimes what I encourage employers to do is get um, consent or if they're asking for a meeting, get um, the medical practitioner or the treating doctor to say, yes, they're fit to attend XYZ meeting. Because you don't want a situation where they say I attended the meeting and that exacerbated my illness or injury. Um, as I said, understanding the underlying issue, because there might be easy fixes to these things. Like it might be um, that they feel like they're being bullied by their manager, which may not be the case or it might be the case, um, but we might be able to move them to a different team or have them in a different area, things like that, um, which is an easy fix and can be easily done and means they don't have to be on an extended absence for five or six months. Um, so think about those types of things and really trying to understand what the underlying issue is um, so that you can help navigate that. Um, and also, if it is a personal issue, thinking about do we have like an EAP or something like that that we can offer um, the employee to help them kind of navigate those issues, um, things like that. Um, as I said, generally, it's either they return back to work or there is a termination. 
Now, when we're um, talking about a termination, we really need to make sure we've checked all the boxes to get to that termination point because of those issues that I was talking about before in terms of the temporary absence, um, the work health and safety duty, if they've got a disability, um, they might also have a discrimination claim. So think about things like that. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention about the temporary absence um, point is there's sometimes a misconception that as soon as they reach that three month mark, we're free to terminate. So once they're over the three months, yep, okay, on the <laughs> on the day after that three months has ended, we can we're fine to terminate and we're not in breach of anything. That's not technically true. And also the commission has given us guidance on that. So whilst yes, the employee won't be able to bring a claim under the temporary absence provision, they might be able to bring a claim, for example, as an unfair dismissal and say, you didn't engage in a procedurally fair process to terminate my employment and therefore I've been unfairly dismissed. Or if it's a disability, so it's an illness or injury that meets the definition of a disability, you haven't considered reasonable accommodations or the inherent requirements of the role before terminating my employment and therefore you're in breach of the discrimination legislation and that's unlawful. Um, so it's not an automatic right that once they're past that three month mark, we can terminate the employment. That's sometimes a misconception that um, we see that, yeah, as soon as we reach that kind of three month mark, we're all um, good to terminate. So in terms of considering the termination, think about the medical evidence that we have and make sure we've got enough medical evidence to be able to make a decision that we say that they can't perform the inherent requirements of the role or that the illness is going to extend for a, such a long period of time that we can't accommodate that or make that reasonable adjustment. Make sure we've considered what those reasonable adjustments might be if there are any. And if we're saying we can't make those reasonable adjustments, we've got reasons why that is. Uh, make sure we're engaging in a procedurally fair process. So that example I gave you, um, that even though we might have done all the boxes in terms of medical evidence and reasonable adjustments, if we fail on the procedurally fair process, so saying to them, this is all the information we have, this is the current state of our mind in terms of a decision regarding your ongoing employment. What do you say about that? If we fail to do that, they might have a claim for unfair dismissal. And we don't want to have gone through that whole process and then fail at the last point because we don't do a procedurally fair process. Um, the other thing to think about is look at your contract and your policy. So is there anything in there or is there anything in the enterprise agreement, if you have one, that dictates or governs how we need to deal with these situations? So sometimes organisations get tripped up because they've gone through this whole process and they didn't kind of check back at their enterprise agreement and the enterprise agreement says something that we have to do in terms of a termination process, particularly with absence, or it says something around absences and we haven't checked that box. Um, and so that might give the employee the ability to say, well, you've breached the enterprise agreement or you've breached my contract of employment, things like that. Um, or it might breach of policy might come into an unfair dismissal, things like that. So just be mindful of checking those things to make sure that we're complying with those um, requirements as well in terms of what obligations we have. Um, in terms of the claims, as I talked about, you might have an unfair dismissal claim, but in my view, if you go through that procedurally fair process and we can establish that there's um, medical evidence that shows they can't perform the inherent requirements of the role, you're going to be pretty solid on an unfair dismissal. The general protections claims are the claims I'm talking about in terms of temporary absence from work due to illness or injury. Um, so again, if it's been longer than three months, you're not going to have that risk, but you still, they could still bring a discrimination claim under the general protections provision, or they could say, I exercised a right to take that leave and you're terminating me because of my employment. So that's where the reasons for termination become very important. And I encourage you to have notes or um, meetings around those reasons before you terminate. So again, a, a common situation is someone's been off work. So say for a month or a couple of months, um, dealing with perhaps some mental, some mental health issues, things like that. They come back to work and then a couple of months later, they're not performing and we terminate their employment because of that performance they will undoubtedly say if they want to bring a claim that the reason for termination is because I took that two months off four months ago. We need solid documentary evidence that says, no, 
the reason for termination is because of these performance issues which we've talked about you with you for the last two months um, and we've given you the opportunity to improve and unfortunately you haven't improved. Now with a mental health, if it's a mental health um, uh, reason that they've had off for the last two months, you also need to consider that in terms of what performance you're requiring of them. So that should be a factor in considering their performance. So um, has that uh, impacted on their performance? Um, and you need to take um, consideration of that um, in relation to terminating their employment. Uh, I talked about discrimination claims. So separate from a general protections claim, there's discrimination legislation, both at a state and a federal level. Um, so again, if we can show that they can't perform inherent requirements of the role, um, and we've considered those reasonable adjustments, then the termination is unlikely to be unlawful, but we need to go through those steps. Um, workers' compensation claims, so again, that's just part and parcel of unfortunately having employees. You will have situations where um, an employee brings a workers' compensation claim. Again, um, if someone does have a workers' compensation claim or is on workers' comp, um, and again, I'm not a workers' compensation lawyer, there's lawyers that specifically do workers' comp, but um, again, a general some general feedback that I usually get is, oh, they're on workers' comp, so I can't terminate their employment. Again, that is not technically true. So what the workers' compensation legislation says is, in New South Wales, I'm talking about in that state specific, um, it says that you, in the first six months of someone being on a workers' comp claim, you can't terminate their employment because of the workers' comp claim. So if you were doing, for example, a redundancy and you were doing a restructure, and it just so happens that the position you no longer require is currently performed by someone on workers' comp, that doesn't mean that you can't terminate that employment because of the redundancy or no longer requiring that position. Uh, it would be in breach of the legislation if you did just terminate them and say, we're terminating you because you've commenced a workers' compensation claim. Um, work health and safety claims, as I said, they're not as common um, anymore because of these other um, avenues that employees have. But you sometimes do, do see, particularly if employees are represented and they're trying to um, navigate uh, an exit, you might see reference to duty of care and you have a duty of care to provide me with a healthy and safe work environment. And those um, steps that I've gone through with you in terms of what you would be doing in terms of getting the medical evidence, assessing the requirements of the role and making reasonable adjustments and considering those um, would all go to defending um, a work health and safety claim. Um, so like I said, you see those as much um, these days as you historically did because of the other avenues that employees have. Um, and then I just wanted to finish with some um, practical tips. So in terms of meetings, I would encourage you to plan meetings, particularly if you're HR and you're not going to be in the meeting, plan them with the manager so they know what to say um, and, and what not to say um, in terms of those meetings. Make sure you give the employee opportunities to respond to any action that you're um, proposing. Communicate about changes that might happen or the accommodations that you're um, proposing to make and what impact that's going to have on them. Um, and also keep records. So keep records of your meetings. If we decide to terminate for some other reason, make sure we've got records about that reason um, and that's the solid reason rather than any absence or things like that. Um, don't get uh, medical assessments done without the consent of the employee. Don't generally refuse a request to take um, leave. One thing that comes up, not, not commonly, but um, is fake medical certificates. So employees doctoring um, medical certificates with different dates and things like that. Um, again, that's obviously a, a ground for termination in terms of the falsifying of the record in and of itself. Um, and generally what I would encourage you to do is contact the medical um, practice that's listed. They generally won't be able to give you too much information. They'll say we can't because of patient confidentiality. But I've had situations where they've at least confirmed that they didn't go on that day. For example, whatever the medical certificate date is dated or that the doctor didn't work that day. Um, so you can get information like that, that would, and then you would put that to the employee and obviously say, what do you say about that? Um, but that's how you generally um, deal with fake medical certificates. There was also a case um, where an individual um, had asked for the day off to attend the football game. 
Um, and he was told no, because um, obviously that would have just been annual leave. And we know that you can only take annual leave with um, in consent or agreement between employer and employee. So he was told no. And then it just so happened that he was sick on that day. Um, so again, the employer questioned the validity of that sickness and the medical certificate that was provided and terminated him for misconduct. He tried to bring um, a claim saying he was terminated because of the illness. And the commission found in that case that he wasn't actually ill, that he did go to the game um, in those circumstances. So again, you have situations like that where employees try to um, kind of skirt around and some employees don't think like they take the day off and then they post on social media that they're at some function when they're meant to be sick. And you can use all that evidence in terms of a termination because that goes to obviously the conduct issue. Um, so, but generally, if there's a legitimate illness, don't refuse an employee's um, personal leave. Um, don't refuse generally to pay for independent medical. That's something that we incur as employers. Um, don't take irrelevant considerations into account when deciding um, about an employee's employment. So if it's not related to the inherent requirements of the role. So if, for example, um, you get something back in the IME that says, 30 years ago, they had an issue with their knee or something like that. And that has had no impact on their ability to perform their role to date. You can't suddenly rely on that and say, oh, we're terminating you because you didn't um, tell us about that and that's a risk or things like that. You would need to assess that and say, what's the impact of that? Does that have any impact on your ability to do the job now? Um, and if it's irrelevant, you can't um, use it. Also, if they, for example, disclose they... And again, in the IMEs, you usually get information about their history, like if they ask about drug use and things like that. So again, if it says they recreationally used drugs 30 years ago, not relevant to your decision to whether they stay employed or not. Um, and also don't just sit there and think you have to go through the process alone. Um, so speak to others. If you have a HR team, um, speak to other people, or if you have um, a lawyer that you typically use, speak to them or um, if speak to the IME around what... Um, that you think that is needed, they usually will speak to you as well. Um, so just don't sit there and think, oh gosh, I've got to navigate all of this. And I would also um, communicate that message to your managers and encourage them to come to you when they've got these issues, because it's easier to navigate with the two of you or the team working together rather than um, generally leaving the manager to their own devices, because that's when you generally have longer absences that haven't been managed well. Um, in those situations. So it's about communicating to your managers that you really want them to be talking to you um, along the way and managing that absence. Um, I think that's it in terms of what I had to cover. Hopefully you found that helpful um, in terms of things to think about. Um, again, it's not an easy thing. Um, if it's, if it's an absence that's just a couple of weeks, generally you'll have those people return. Um, and it's just that they needed time off or things like that. Um, it's those longer term absences that really become the issue. And it's about staying on top of those absences and knowing what we can and can't do in those situations um, and thinking about how we can kind of proactively take steps to deal with those situations by looking at what we've got in our contracts and having a plan in place about how we deal with these things, putting a diary entry to follow up. So I have a matter at the moment where we're getting a medical certificate every month and we have like basically a diary entry the week before to say, okay, what are we doing? Do we need to do anything different for the next month? Do we want the employee to give us any more information, things like that? So you're not just letting it fall by the wayside. Um, any questions from anyone? Yeah, hey, Erin, I had a real quick one. It's just Ben Hughes Hi, ben. from yes. Baker and Program. How are you doing? Oh, good, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, just real quick with the consent for the IME. So how does that fit with if you've got like a provision in the contract or in the policy or whatever, it says that you, you we can ask you to do an IME from time to time mm -hmm. and then they turn around and say, oh, no, you, you, I don't, you don't have my consent. I'm not refusing to sign this consent form for the report to come over to you or whatever. Yeah. How do you manage that yeah. situation? Yep. So you would deal with that generally in the same way. So they're refusing, they're not complying with their contract. So you would could potentially rely on that as a reason for termination. Um, but generally the consent to um, get the report and things from the IME is separate from the provision usually in the contract that says we have the ability to send you to an IME. So when I'm talking about consent, I'm talking about really the consent 
um, of the employee to release those records to us. So from the report. So it's it's two things and you probably, you might have that in the contract that says you consent to us getting that report. Um, but I and the doctor will usually say, we want that signed consent. Um, but if they're not doing that, then you would just rely on that as a breach of the contract. And again, say um, you're failing to follow your obligations under the contract and we're considering terminating your employment. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. No worries. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you very much for joining me. As I said, if you would like the recording, just send me an email and I can shoot that across to you. And I'll also send out the slides. Enjoy the rest of your day. Can I ask one question? Ask yeah, one question. Sure. Yes, please. Hello. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Not a problem. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate forum, but um, can, can you give any guidance at the moment in regards to um, uh, safety and welfare of staff in an office in regards to the current COVID crisis? Oh, Peter. Or is, um, is that off the, off the planet at the moment? Oh, that's a million dollar question, Peter. <laughs> um, exactly. So no, one, no one can answer it. No one no. can answer it. Um, so again, are you talking about getting people to come back to the office and also having unvaccinated people in the office and relying on the health and safety obligation? Yes, absolutely spot on. And uh, I just got off the health minister's uh, assistant and the answer was, oh, well, in your circumstance, you better wait till the 1st of December. And I said, yeah, but in between <laughs> now and the 1st of December, if I have a couple of deaths in my office, what do I do with the bodies? Yeah. You know? um, yeah. It's really, it's, it is a bloody mess, excuse my French. And everyone says, now, you know, there, there, there's nothing mandated. There's nothing no. mandated by anyone, particularly in this regard. And, it, and above everything else, it is one of the most crucial issues right now for every one of us in an yeah. office arrangement. Yeah, and I don't and think we can't seem to get some answers. No, um, so the reason they're saying the first of December, I think, Peter, is because of that um, the recovery plan, and from the first of December, as I understand from that recovery plan, and again, it's not in any public health direction yet, um, that you can return at the employer's discretion about return to work, and there's no um, restriction on vaccinated versus unvaccinated. That's why they're saying the 1st of December. My Correct. understanding my understanding is Correct. that before that, to go back to the office, they're saying, again, if you can work from home, you should. Um, and also, I think there's a restriction on vaccinations, I'm not sure, um, or only vaccinated people coming back to um, the workplace. My view is you can um, rely on that work health and safety obligation um, in terms of saying, unless you're double vaccinated, you can't come back to the office. Um, after the 1st of December, I think you're going to have issues around maintaining that, um, given what the um, government has issued in relation to that. Um, and I think people would have a hard time, unfortunately, if someone died, that's going to be quite um, horrendous in any event, but I'm not sure there would be any claim against um, the organisation in that respect. Um, as long as you're implementing other measures like the two square metre rule that's in place and you've got your QR codes and you're doing all those other safety measures, all you need to do is take re all reasonably practical steps. Um, so that's what I would say in that situation. And there's no easy answer, Peter, unfortunately. No, no, I just wanted to make sure that I'm not the only one going nuts here. You've just confirmed oh, no. that I'm not, and I really yes. appreciate it. <laughs> no, Thank we're you so all not, much. We're all nuts. Thank together, you. Peter. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone for joining. I'll put my mask on now, okay? <laughs> okay, enjoy the rest See of your ya. afternoon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well done. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.